welcome to our 10 a.m. Collider coffee break on this Friday morning where we just take some time uh, to chat with you about what we've been up to this week. And we wanted to start off right off the top. You know, you probably noticed this week there were no new podcasts of any sort. Um, and I want to talk about our navigators shortly. But we spent the majority of the week in conferences, um, virtual conferences. For um, the past couple of years, we've been involved with something called eShip, which is an, initi an initiative through the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, which is a Kansas City-based organization um, that supports entrepreneurs. And for the past four years, they've kind of gathered together ecosystem builders from across the country uh, to come together, North, typically in Kansas City, every summer to really just talk about issues facing entrepreneurial ecosystem builders and so people supporting entrepreneurs, how to sustain that work, how to kind of catalyze that work with common language and to make it sustainable um, to help entrepreneurial ecosystems and startup communities across the US. So that's where we were for two days this week. And uh, there's also one more day towards the end of the month, but um, they're a fantastic community to engage with you know, every time I feel like we take away lessons learned and connect with different people from across the US. So we wanted to share high level things that we, we learned and took away with you. And then we're definitely wanting to do a more in-depth podcast with that sometime over the next few weeks um, with some other people from the region who attended. I think we had, I wrote down everybody who went, it, we, over, over 12 people from the region, from Minnesota attended virtually of course so um i'll send it over to jamie to um <laughs> to uh let you know what what his major takeaways were from from the eship summit this year a couple of things in a couple of different areas so the biggest thing uh as someone who puts on a lot of events and has put on a lot of events during this pandemic pandemic um i think the production value of this conference was far and away like the best I've experienced so far. Um, they, they didn't make it overly complicated. So you always came back to like a main web page and it told you, you know, here's what you're doing now and click this button. And that's what I like. Just very easy, like click this, click this button. And if you were, uh, if, if the event was designed to maintain or to impart information, like it, it, that's just exactly what it did. There were no chat rooms or no, were no breakout rooms. Like it was just that information. And then when it was made to engage, you know, then it felt like there were zoom breakout rooms and, and it was very easy to, to select what you were interested in and who do you, who you engage with. So, um, just very, very good. And this was the first great example, I think of, or a glimpse maybe of the future of how a lot of these things may work. And they, they pulled it off very, very well. So production value aside, um, you know, my, my takeaway from eShip each year is it's, it's very much like, um, like an organized religion, right? Here we are, all these ecosystem builders, we're so busy in our own communities trying to advocate for support our entrepreneurs and it gets very lonely and isolating. Even when there's a small group of us doing it, it still feels very much like, you know, it, it, that our work isn't celebrated or supported as much as, we, you know, maybe we feel it should be. And to get together with, you know, I can't even remember how many attendees. It was seven They said 800. They said 800. Yeah. It's like 800 attendees who are all doing the same work from around the world. It just sort of raises your spirits, it gets you excited again. Um, at the same time, it, it also helps to understand that many of the problems that we face in our region are happening everywhere. The same sorts of problems, not just pandemic related, but a lot of other things around um, how, do you, how do you work with traditional economic developers um, and maybe introduce entrepreneurship as, as a model that should be grafted on or in some cases, some stories we heard from people really uh, do an entrepreneur first economic development strategy. So there are things like that where you can see communities that are maybe a little bit behind ours. You can see some that are right at we, where we are and you can see some that are way far ahead and just being able to learn as well as support 
other communities uh, is just it's just a fantastic, amazing thing for for me personally to feel like the work I do has a lot of meaning and has a lot of value. So uh, I think that's my biggest takeaway. I always come back like super charged up, super full of ideas. Uh, many of the things you've seen in this in, in this community has really come as a result of either a connection I've made at eShip or eShip itself, just learning from other communities. Um, I, yeah, that's the that's the dirty little secret of what I do. It's like, it's not usually something I create, it's something I learn from, and then I'm able to apply the context of what's going on in our community and be able to sort of modify it a bit and then uh, introduce it to the world, yeah. so. I think that's a really interesting point though, too, because, you know, we talk about ecosystems and, you know, where the boundaries of that are, but they're all so different, you know? We can learn from each other, but it has to be like modified. You can't take something that works somewhere else and pick it up and put it down. And often it's really hard to like collaborate across ecosystems because a lot of the times there's really not that many similarities of people who make it up. Although problems can be the same, you know, approaches and strategy can be shockingly different. You know, even if we're talking here in the Twin Cities, I mean, I think everyone listening would understand how different those approaches need to be. So I think that's one interesting thing too, that, you know, you would hear a lot of these stories of collaboration, but it does seem to have a geographical boundary because if you stretch further, you know, like you were saying, Jamie, you can understand what's happening and modify that approach to your community, but it has to be modified. And that's why you don't see a lot of like collaborations between like, let's say Rochester and I don't know, Salt Lake City, because it's, we're just so different. There should be more of those, um, but that's a personal thing. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, building on what you're saying, uh, I found, so I attended one particular panel, which featured uh, someone from, oh, I'm going to screw this up, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and also Madison, Wisconsin. And I got more out of that. And I think that's because it's, it's close to, it is regional um, in, a, in a, maybe a broader context than we think of here in Minnesota. But a lot of the problems and a lot of the issues that they had to overcome really are very similar to what we face here in Minnesota. So I think that's where I was taking like five, six pages of notes because it, it, they, they just have it. It was so similar. They've encountered pretty much the same barriers. And it's been great to hear that they've been able to find ways to overcome that. So that's a, it's a really cool thing just to get to know basically your neighbors down the street, if you think about it that way. You know, I, um, <laughs> they asked us to draw like a picture. So like, like you were saying, Jamie, they did a really good job of breaking you out into small groups. Like I was in a group with five other people at one point. And I don't know if they did this in your group, but they made us draw these pictures of what we were feeling. And this was like horrible, but it was trying to say like focusing on the entrepreneur because, and that's a big thing at these summits, you know, typically with a lot of economic development, you know, we think top down and we try and recruit outside companies to your region, but they had a fantastic story from Albuquerque when the mayor, I think, I don't remember when, I think it was like 2012, actually took a stand and said, no, we're focusing on the entrepreneurs, the people growing businesses. We're not focusing on recruiting companies and how that really flourished, um, the small, allowed that small business community to flourish in the region. But again, it wasn't just like one person. What I also learned to think about was more of like the systems approach. And I think we knew that, but maybe didn't quite, or I knew that, but didn't quite have the language to, to say it. But having a systems approach, and again, we hear this again and again, that all these pieces have to come together and you can only move as fast as you all trust each other and you all have a, cl a, a clear, um, solid mission that you all can get behind to move it forward. So that's something, um, kind of one of my big takeaways. And again, I agree, one of the, the best um, kind of groups I was in was one um, of an initiative in Kansas City through um, creating what they're calling eShip communities, which is basically um, 
clusters of community that um, are inclusive, equitable, and entrepreneurial. And it's operated through a group called Forward Cities. Um, it was very, very, very similar to our Navigator program. I mean, our Navigator program isn't like, you know, the most groundbreakingly unique thing, but it's just for this community and to implement it successfully is unique. But they're like six to nine months ahead of us with this. So I was able to connect with their navigator who's doing a significant amount of work in the Hispanic Latino community in Kansas City. So hopefully we will be able to connect with him um, over the next month and really understand, again, since they're nine months ahead of us, you know, what can we learn? And, and their problems, like you said, were pretty similar to what we saw at the beginning was that, you know, you have to do a lot of convincing. Again, you move as fast as trust because when you first talk, start talking to people, they're like, who are you? Why should I talk to you? And what do I get out of it? And what are you trying to do? So I think we've moved past that for the most part. But that was a really interesting group to me. And I'm hoping we can continue that conversation with them because I'm really interested to know too, like theirs is a two-year plan. Ours is a two-year plan. What happens at the end of those two years? So yeah, hopefully we'll be able to connect with that group soon. I was in one of these small campfire discussions um, with an entrepreneur from Lakeland, Florida, and we were talking about these things. And I asked her, you know, well, how do you encourage more entrepreneurs in your community to step up and, and lead? And she said, basically, she wants to see the community better um, see and acknowledge entrepreneurs and um, have some of that uh, fear taken away um, and feel more encouraged. So I guess for anyone listening, we'd be, who is an entrepreneur in Rochester, we'd be really interested to hear, like, how do you feel that the community could better see you and acknowledge your existence in the community? Because like Jamie was saying, we need to hear it from the entrepreneurs, you know, what would, what they would like to see, not what we think, because that doesn't make sense. So the other thing I was noticing last night is I got a lot of time with people I wouldn't normally get a chance to communicate with during these conferences. So usually there's, there's a couple of individuals that really stand out, whether they give talks or they're just uh, very, very connected people that you want to get to know. And of course, in a room full of connectors, all the connectors know that those are the people to talk to. So they usually get swarmed to the point where, you know, me as a, as a, as a heads down, look at my shoes, Midwesterner, is kind of like, well, I don't want to bother them. It's, it, I was able to just reach out on their communications platform, ping them right away. And I had a couple of private Zoom calls. I've had a couple of chat exchanges. I've had a couple of email exchanges. I've got some calls set up for next week. You know, I was able to reach a lot more of these people in this virtual conference than I ever was, would be able to physically because I would have to basically stalk those people at the conference and try to find time with them. And it was just easy with this platform to be able to reach out and say, hey, do you have 10 minutes? So that's another big takeaway, I think, from, from Isha. All right. I think the last thing we wanted to leave people with is um, we wanted to introduce our ecosystem navigators to you. Um, the story came out yesterday, uh, so you can check it out there and actually see their faces. But I just wanted to take just one more minute with you to um, introduce you to our navigators. So we have three um, ecosystem navigators that are coming on. Their training's actually, their first training is today. So they're gonna be taking this month until mid-October to um, work with us, understand their roles, um, and get some guidance from us. But so our, our first ecosystem navigator is Christopher Loving. Uh, Christopher, he was born in Chicago, but he's been in Rochester since 2014. He's been married seven years and has two children. And he's a Christian minister, teacher, college football, and basketball official, and he's an entrepreneur. Um, our second navigator is Sarah Louise Henry. She's been a part of the community here for 30 years. She really has a passion to serve, to serve marginalized communities. She has a bachelor's degree in social work and a master's degree, which she got from the University of Southern California and she currently serves as director of social work for Glazon Group and also teaches at Winona State. Uh, she's a certified ACE trainer and works with the Hope Fuse Mentorship Program. And we had 
um, Ness Kambaki and Hope Fuse on the podcast a few during the pandemic, so you can check that out. And our third navigator is Julio Molino. Uh, Julio's originally from a small town in northern Mexico, but he came to the U.S. when he was 10. He came here with, for what started as a family vacation, but they ended up staying. Um, and he's now been here for um, several decades. He has learned a lot through trial and error, um, through his own experiences. Um, and he's really excited um, about the lives he can have an impact on. He is also a husband and a father of two beautiful girls. So we are so excited uh, to work with these individuals to really um, see what they can do in the community, see that the, the impact that they can have. Um, so stay tuned for more from our three navigators. Again, we want them to be doing more of the talking a lot of these times, so we will be sure to have them on tons of podcasts, tons of um, videos, maybe not tons because we want them to do the work, <laughs> but you will hear and see from them shortly. You're all, you're all sick of us, so uh, it's, it's nice to have some new faces as part of Collider. And I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm so excited about this. Like, you know, as, as, as two people who conceived of this idea, um, who never quite honestly thought it would get funded, um, hats off to the Kauffman Foundation for believing us. And then all the work that Amanda's done to sort of prove the point that this is needed, that it needs to happen. And then finally to see it, like today's the day where things start happening. You know, a lot of this has been theoretical, it's been research-based, now it's action-based, it's execution. And I am so excited and privileged to get to know these three people and to allow them, uh, hopefully to learn a little bit about the ecosystem building work of ours and then be able to take that and make it 20 times better that we ever did. So um, just really, really, really stoked about having these navigators on board. Absolutely. Well, I think we've probably gone way over our time, so we should probably wrap it up. But um, again, I think the best way you can help us here is to um, like this video, wherever you're listening in, make sure you're subscribing wherever you're listening in and share it with somebody. Um, this takes you less than 10 seconds. It's completely free for you to do, so please, um, consider doing that and that would really be a big help to us. Um, I will turn it over to Jamie for any final thoughts and to uh, sign off on the video. So uh, I guess, you know, the video is already a little bit long. So uh, I think I just want to say if you're an entrepreneur in the community and uh, I would love to talk to you. So feel free to uh, email me, Jamie, J-A-M-I-E at collider.mn or hello at collider.mn. We would love to chat with you. Uh, we're set. We're scheduling a series of 15-minute phone calls with entrepreneurs to check in and see how we can help as an organization. And so we just we want to hear from you. So please, doesn't matter where you're at. Uh, we'll even take people outside of this region if you want. Just just let's connect and let's chat. So um, thank you all for uh, listening to this edition of the 10 a.m. Coffee Break. Um, Thank you all for contributing to the entrepreneurial ecosystem of Rochester and have a great day.